Hi, I'm Sara from the Media Interaction Lab. And today I will present our design investigation of embroidered interactive elements on non-wearable textile interfaces. There has been a growing interest in subtle integrated human machine interfaces and smart textiles as one of the most natural and pleasant and flexible ones have the potential to really be the interface of the future. However, as is the case with all new technology, we have to find a way to somehow communicate this smartness to the users. And that is where the how these interfaces are designed becomes very important. And as we started getting more into that and searching through what has already been done, we realized that even the basic design rules and principles haven't yet been tested or proved on textiles. So we had to go to the very beginning and today I will present what we found out as the result of this process. We were not yet at a point where we could keep any specific use cases in mind. So we decided to focus on non wearables as findings in these, this area uh, would be more general and could then consequentially be applied to more than one specific application wearables included, but are also entertainment or automotive, fitness, health, medicine, anything really. Uh, while choosing and creating elements for our research, we kept the Maya principle in mind. This stands for most advanced yet acceptable and talks about the interaction jump between what the users are currently used to and what these new technologies have to offer. Basically, that this jump should not be too big. In essence, this states that if we go too far from what people are currently used to, then they will most likely not be not accepted. So employing this same logic, we looked into the interfaces surrounding us today and we took the most commonly used interactive elements, which are buttons and sliders and their corresponding in interactions, which is pressing and sliding. Of course, there are already some examples of successful textile interfaces already out there, some of which I'm showing here, but they all seem to be kind of intuitively done. It bothered us a bit that there was a lack of a systematic investigation that could aid the designers to more formally evaluate and design such interfaces in practice. And so we present our main contributions in this paper through this filtering process that I'm showing here, where each next stage gets more and more defined and the assumptions more and more become statements until we finalize them into the five design recommendations. I will present them today. And for us to be able to understand how we got to them, I will also talk about what we did in the user study and what the results were from there. So the user study took place last summer, that was 2019 in Linz, in Austria, various um, public places. It included 30 randomly selected participants, all with completely various occupations. And we tested five different experiments, each corresponding to a statement we wanted to either confirm or deny. So the first experiment was about recognizing tactile contrast. We tested a contrast of heights, shapes and textures. There was always a set of four elements. One was different and three were the same. We call them defaults. These were circles, had no added height and had a very bland polyester texture. And then we asked our participants if only through touch, so they were not allowed to look, can they recognize which element in this set is different? And so in the case of height, it showed that the contrast most recognized was a difference of 1.6 millimeters or higher. This was recognized by 29 participants out of 30, so almost everybody. In the contrasts of shape, these, this, the biggest contrast was edged among circular shapes. The best recognized example for us was a triangle among circles by 22 participants out of 30. But we were a bit surprised that the texture was actually not recognized so well. So the contrast that was recognized the most was leather, 
um, but only by 13 participants out of 30, so less than half, so not really a lot. But coming from this, our first design recommendation is use explicit contrast to imply differentiation. And when I say explicit, I mean, for example, in the context of height, this is at least 1.6 millimeters. So of course, everything uh, lower than this is still a contrast, but might not be explicit enough for most people to be able to recognize it. And then the easiest tactile contrast to recognize is height followed by shape and then texture. The experiment, experiment number two was about smallest recognizable sizes. We again ask the participants not to look at these samples, only to touch them. And if they are able to recognize the shape that they're feeling, can they name it for us? Our assumption was that the border between what they can recognize and what they cannot would be around 13 millimeters. This comes from Braille. So Braille, each Braille character is about 13 millimeters in size, which is also roughly the size of a fingertip. This proved to be the case in textiles as well. So shapes in the, size, in the sizes of 13 millimeters or higher were recognized by 29 participants out of 30, almost everybody. So we can conclude that shapes should not be smaller than 6.5 millimeters and the optimal shape size is 13 millimeters or bigger. Of course, if we do want the user to be able to recognize what these shapes are. Experiment number three was about convex and concave elements. Basically, we wanted to see if concave elements can be perceived as interactive as well. This was the only experiment we put in a specific use case or actually into different specific use cases. Also to see how perception between them would change and if it would. So this first one was car window controls, how you would control these two elements to go up or down or volume controls, how you would increase or decrease volume. There showed to be a slight difference in between the two, but our initial statement, can concave elements be perceived as interactive, did prove to be true. So concave services are also perceived as interactive and the combination of a convex and a concave element can be used for opposite commands and it usually works really well. In experiment number four, we were focusing on how influence of shape um, can, how shapes can influence interaction. Uh, this was inspired by Don Norman's theory of affordances. So he claims that objects should be designed in a way that only one way of interacting with them is possible. So here we had a few different examples. Some were very clear, some were not very clear. So the space bar there was an example of that was intentionally made not so clear. So it could be a slider, it could be a space bar, and people also gave very different answers to what it could be. So it showed that we do have to very much keep in mind of the previous or like the existing knowledge that the users already have and what are some of the expectations that they have while interacting with our interface. So in, in the in the example here, the circle, the triangle and the square were all immediately recognized as buttons also grouped together by 28 participants, mostly everybody. So the design recommendation number four, you can use the shape of an element to indicate required interaction. But as mentioned, we have to keep in mind what the expectations and the association from the side of the user are. So these shapes have to be designed really unambiguously, really clear on what this interaction should be. In the final experiment, number five, we were testing the recognition of symbols. The question here was, uh, again, only through touch. Can people still be able to recognize, even if they are able to sense only parts of the symbol, can they still kind of trigger what this is from our visual memories. This kind of proved not to be the case. Although the symbols were picked specifically 
in a way that it, they would be recognized immediately for most of us if we look at them, we are not so well at recognizing them only through touch. So the one that was recognized the most was the star, still only by 15 participants. So this is half of everybody we tested. So the last design recommendation, design all shapes as simple as possible. And here I would also like to add that in the case of textiles, maybe it would make sense to combine this with also other parameters. So for example, um, different textures or different heights, uh, different sizes, stuff like this. So this brings me to um, the last point, which is prototypes and applications. So to demonstrate our design recommendations, we challenged a group of nine designers and development developers to implement several textile prototypes. Um, and they really immediately started with hands-on prototyping, started combining uh, these recommendations into either single interaction elements or whole interfaces, as we see here in this little speaker example. Um, they also started mixing these recommendations together. They said they had no problem using sight um, as well and started adding visual icons, also colors. They started thinking how connections to the boards and the electronics could also be a part of the design. Uh, they also tried out some textile icons. These were really interesting examples for us to see this in practice. So in our paper, we presented a filtering process uh, from the initial design assumptions from the ideation phase, then to the expert interviews. Both of these are described in more detail in the paper. Um, and today we went through the main insights from the user study and the five design recommendations for textile interfaces. Um, as our point from the beginning was to create some sort of a guide on where to even start. What is the fallback? What are some things that you can always base your design on? And I think that we have proved this to work quite well as inspiration, as some basic theory, uh, as a kind of a starting point. But in the end, of course, to take this and go on, go further, uh, run wild, go crazy and do new crazy stuff. Thank you very much.